First of all, thank you to Talis for inviting me here to speak. Um, great opportunity. And I'm happy to be christening this new workspace. It's great. Really? Yeah. Thank you for coming. Okay. The, um, what I want to try and do today is talk you through the manufacture of leather from start to finish. So where, from where the skins come from to uh, the skins going out of our warehouse or in the factory. Um, and I'm going to do this with uh, various slides showing photographs, um, a few movie images and some diagrams. Um, and it's going to be a tour of our factory. So we're, we're going to show you most of the operations that we undertake. This is our old factory in Curry, which is just outside of Scotland. Um, we were there from the early 1940s. Um, as you can see, it's quite an old building. It's a Victorian paper mill when we moved in, um, and we occupied six floors. Um, it started falling down, and we decided, um, upon receiving an offer from a developer, that now was a good time to move out. So in 2010, we moved out, and we're now in a place, uh, a modern unit in Livingston, which is a small city halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, as, as you'll see in the later slides, uh, the factory set up on one floor, so we don't have to navigate those old rickety uh, stairs in the old building. So where do our things come from, or where do the raw materials come from? Um, on the whole, we buy, we buy our goat skin from two sources, East India and New Zealand. However, these are set in stone. Supplies of raw materials are very difficult and the manufacturers who are producing book binding leathers are the most demanding of all the leather buyers. Uh, book binding leather, the raw material has to be of really the very highest quality. So if we are offered skins from Mexico, for instance, and they're of good enough quality, we'll, we will buy them. Uh, one of the deciding factors is how we buy them, in what state they come in. So the skins from India come in a dry state, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that later. And the skins from New Zealand come wet and haven't been tanned. It's worth, worth bearing in mind that if we are producing alum tord leathers, which are, which are the white skins some of you guys are selling, they aren't actually tanned and they're produced in a different way. But the only way we can produce those is from raw material. We can't produce alum tord skins from a leather which is, has been already tanned. So as you can see from the aloes, we can only produce those from the New Zealand skins, and it's the New Zealand skins which are coming into us raw in a raw state. Likewise, calf coming from New Zealand and the Indian subcontinent, and we occasionally buy them in a raw state from the UK. Um, as a rule, the skins which are available to us from the UK aren't good enough quality. And sheepskin again come for, uh, are coming from New Zealand. The, uh, the Kiwis do very well by us uh, on the raw material. And this is ironic because at any one time the 36 million sheep skins in sheep in the UK, but none of their skins are good enough quality after they are uh, slaughtered. Okay, we can buy our leather in three states. The first state is wet sorted, and these are calf skins, which actually are English calf. And as you can see, they've still got their hair on, and they are, they are pulled off the animals. They are laid on pallets, and between each, uh, between each skin is a layer of salt. And these are piled on top of each other, and with the weight on the top, it forces the, it forces the salt into the skins, which cures the leather. Um, and then occasionally there'll be Converted, so the uh, the skins at the top become the skins at the bottom. So the advantages of buying like this is that we have 100% control on the production of the leather. 
from the hairing all the way through the, to the tanning and to the finish. Uh, one of the big problems of, of, of buying a leather like this is that if we're buying it from hot countries, that the skins can rot during transit. So it's all very well buying from cold countries where um, we can control the, the, the temperature. But um, a lot of times the ships are going over the equator and they can get really hot. And we, we can end up with skins which are quite, uh, uh, in quite a poor state when we get them. Uh, also, if, if, if the wrong kind of salt has been used, um, then it would also cause damage. We can only use mine salt, we can't use salt from, uh, from uh, seawater. So that can also cause problems. And because of the poor sorting practices, we very rarely now buy skins like this. So the second way we can buy skins is pickled. And these skins are coming to us already de -haired. so the hair's been taken off. Uh, they come to us in a pickling solution, much like you would use for gherkins or cucumbers. Uh, very similar, in fact. Um, the advantage is, it's cut, for us, it's cutting out quite a large chunk of the processing. Um, and it's a time-consuming chunk, but the dehairing takes quite a long time. Um, and they're coming in in a regular form. The big disadvantage is that because we're shipping liquid into the UK from New Zealand, in this case, uh, it's quite expensive to ship liquid. So the shipping is probably doubled than it would be on the previous type of, on the wet sorted. And again, if the pickling isn't done correctly, we can end up with problems later in trying to try to tackle. And then the third way uh, we buy our leather is pre-tanned at source. So these skins are in East Indian skins. Um, you've got calf at the front here, and at the back the goat skins. And these are tanned at source. Um, the best thing about this way of, for us to buy is that the skins are very stable. Once leather is tanned, it's extremely stable. It won't rot um, from the part. And, uh, it's a big advantage that we can store, store the skins like this for many years where, without them deteriorating. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is that we buy these skins by weight. So the clever tanners in India and Pakistan <coughs> and Bangladesh, they stuff the tannage with sand and dirt and mud and we we end up importing quite a lot of sand and stuff which we have to take out. And, uh, it's a clever, uh, clever selling technique. Um, the type of tannage that these skins, type of tannage uh, that these skins have been uh, produced with, is not suitable for bookbinding. Uh, in India, they typically use mimosa as a tanning agent. And the most of those, the most of tanned leathers do not make good bookbinding leather. Uh, you can always tell them the most of tanned leather in its natural state. Those are the ones that go pink around the edges. I'm sure, as bookbinders and as suppliers, you've seen natural skins go pink around the edges. But that's that's from a poor quality tannage. Okay, we're going to start now with a cross section, cross section of verse. Uh, of the skin. And this could be a goat skin or a calf skin. Um, we have at the top in the green line is the epiderm epidermis and that's made from keratin. We also have the hair which is also made from keratin and we have the uh, we have the sweat glands which are the sulfurous glands and the sebaceous glands which are the oil glands. So the oil glands uh, lubricate the hair and the sweat glands are what help the animal while it's alive cool down as it does for us. Uh, at the bottom we have the fat and the flesh in blue and the bit that's important to us as tanners is the dermis which is the orange, the yellow, orange and brown part. So we need, before we can even start tanning the skins, we have to get rid of all the unwanted material. The dermis, the orange, yellow, the yellow, orange, and brown parts are made up of fibre bundles which are woven together. 
And in the Corian, which is the stronger part though, they've got a wide angle of weave. And at the top, in the grey layer, you've got quite a shallow angle of weave. It's a strong angle of weave which gives, gives it the strength, and it's the shallow angle of weave which gives the grain its character. So, which is why calf and goat skins have different, different angles of weave. Um, the other point to mention is the junction or the corium in the middle. Um, this is where the fat of the animals is, is stored. And this is particularly, particularly important with sheepskin. Um, depending on where the animal, uh, what the animal was fed while it was alive and um, the conditions it was kept and when it was killed will depend on how much fat is in that junction area in the middle. So sheepskin, for instance, will have 30, I don't know, 35 to 40 percent of the weight of the skin will be fat, and we have to get rid of that. And any of any of you who have worked with sheepskins will know that they delaminate quite easy, easily. And that delamination happens because the fat's been taken out of the middle of the skin and it's left gaps, which means you can split sheep skin quite easily. Uh, quite easy. So we're going to start the manufacturing process with, with these wet sorted calf skins. All of the wet processes happen in our tan yard. In these drums, about six or eight foot in diameter, they vary. We've got a few different ones. They've got some scale there. That's Roger, by the way. <laughs> and inside the drums, you have paddles. You can just see up the top here. Those are paddles, much like you have in a domestic washing machine, and they help the skins tumble as the uh, as the uh, drum rotates. So the first operation that we have to do with those skins with the hair on is get them back to a state that they were in just as they came into the, the animal. Um, so we need to wash away the salt which had been put on by the abattoir. We have to rehydrate them and we also have to clean off any blood or lo loose matter uh, done which may be on the skins. We do, we do this in, in those drums by adding uh, warm water and biocides and uh, we keep replacing the water over a period of a week to 10 days until those skin, until the water runs clean. And at that stage, we know the skin has been rehydrated to, um, to, to, the right, uh, uh, to the right state. We then need to think about taking the hair off. And this is uh, the liming process, <coughs> which uh, you may have come across before. Uh, First of all, we need to add um, sodium sulfide, which will help dissolve the hair and loosen the hair, the hair root from the uh, hair follicles. Uh, once that's been done over a period of two days, we then add lime, and the lime actually dissolves the, the hair and the epidermis away completely. Lime will only work on the keratin in the epidermis and the hair. It doesn't work on the collagen of the grain and the dermis, which is the part we want. Um, we then have to wash the skins to take the lime out, and as we as we take the lime out, all of the all of the hair that is left inside is, is washed away. We then have to get rid of the flesh and the uh, so this is all quite gory now. No, maybe we should have eaten first. I'm sort of <laughs> um, we then have to take away the flesh layer at the bottom. Um, the tanning that comes later will not penetrate any of the flesh, so we have to take that away. And that's done mechanically using a flesh machine. 
see that it's a helical, uh, helical blade which rotates and it pulls the flesh, the blue, uh, the bit that was represented in that blue light at the bottom of the earlier image, it pulls it off the skin. And these are fleshings, so these are lined fleshings from the skin. Um, up until about 30 years ago, these were sold to makeup com uh, companies to be used in lipsticks. So, gross, but there you go. I don't think they do that anymore. Are you still able to sell it? Or? No, you don't want it. I mean, you can't do it. It's horrible stuff. <laughs> So we've taken the flesh away, we've taken the, the hair root away, we've taken a lot of the uh, sweat glands and the, uh, the sebaceous glands away, and we've taken the e epidermis away. And that's all been done either chemically or mechanically. So the skin we have left is very similar to those skins that we buy pickled from New Zealand. So we've now got to that state, although it's taken us two weeks to do that. So you can see why some, it might may be advantageous for us to buy the skins uh, like this. Scudding. Um, with calf and with goat, as you know, when the animals are alive, they will often have black spots or black patches or brown patches on them. Um, you don't have to get rid of you don't have to get rid of that, um, but if we if you are producing natural and light coloured leathers, it really does help give an even finish. So we are, as far as we know, we're the only com company in the UK which is hand scudding, and hand scudding is a process used to literally squeeze the pigment out of the skin. So there's an unscudded -scud skin. That's probably a calf skin. What we have there is a, I can't really tell, it's a wooden board at an angle and uh, the blade is a wooden handled blunt blade with a slight angle and he's literally squeezing the, pressure with pressure, squeezing the, the remaining pigmentation out of the skin. What, what percentage of these skins do you have to do that? What percentage do most of them have to We do that. We do that on all our calf, on all the book calf. Uh, we don't do it on the uh, repair calf. Um, actually, while I'm talking up, I should just give these out. You can uh, some of the fish shares we can do, so you can just share them around and pass them up and down. And when that process is not done by hand, how is it? How is it done? A lot of people don't bother. Um, you don't really need to do it at all if you're producing a pigmented leather, i.e. a leather with a pigmented finish. Sure. Um, there are there are mechanical ways there are mechanical ways of squeezing the pigment out. Um, I don't know any, but we don't know anyone else is doing it at all. Um, sure. And, and like I say, we really do it to produce. I mean, you're familiar with the fair calf. It's absolutely even. There's no you can can't see any pigmentation, in it. and that's the reason we do it. Uh, and occasionally Roger does it with goat skins as well. Um, if he's producing Alan tall goat or fair goat, he'll, he'll do it the same way, just to get a more even, more even finish. So if you look at the top right hand corner there, you can actually see where it's been cleared. And it's all done with this blade and pressure. So scudding is the last little removal and you think that you don't want? Absolutely. Absolutely correct. It's a very last process and you don't have to do it on every skin for every leather we produce. We now have a piece of material which is still raw, it hasn't been tanned, and it's ready for the next process. Um, just so that you know, if we, if we left it at this state, it would start rotting immediately. So we've got, a, we've got a material which is very, very unstable and we need to tan it. We need to turn it from a raw material into leather. So at Hewitt's we... Um, actually, let's go. There's four 
basic types of tanning materials. There's vegetable tans, which is what we're using. There's mineral tans, such as chrome tanning and aluminium tanning, which is often used on clothing and upholstery. There's aldehyde tans, which are used on uh, often leather goods and bridal, bridalry type leathers. And then there's synthetic tans, which were developed in the Second World War um, because people couldn't get hold of uh, vegetable tans at that time. All of these family of tans can be used on their own, or they can be mixed with each other. So you can mix vegetable and chrome, you can mix aldehyde and vegetable, uh, and you can, uh, you can mix the mineral tans with uh, synthetic tans. And all these different mixtures and combinations will give different characters to the leather. At Hewitt, we use predominantly vegetable ta uh, tannages, and we use uh, Schumach and Quebraco. Sorry, Sh Schumach and Tara, apologize. apologize. And the reason we use these is because they are firstly very light fast, and secondly, they are long-lasting leathers. These are the tannages that for bookbinding leathers will, uh, uh, leather will deteriorate so than many others. And they also give them very round feeling leather, which, which bookbinders like to use. We could use oak if we wanted to. Um, is there a picture of oak in there? No, there isn't. We could use oak tanning, tanning um, which actually is a very good quality tan, but it produces leather which is like wood. It's very hard and uh, inflexible and completely uh, unsuitable for bookbinding leather. So, over many years of experience has taught us that Tara and Schumach is what we want to be using. So these are some sheepskins looking inside one of those drums you saw earlier in a tanning liquor. Um, and this is probably pure Schumach in this case. They will stay in this liquor for about 72 hours and the drums will be rotating all during this time. It, it takes that amount of time for the skins to, for the tan to penetrate the leather. Um, it's a chemical process which is happening. The, once, once the leather's been tanned, it can't be reversed. So a change is being made to the collagen with the tannins inside the uh, tannin. These are some uh, uh, skyless sheepskins, which are, we horse them up to let them drain. And then we go to cross, so we, we allow the skin, we dry the skins in various ways, and I'll explain a bit more about drying later. So these are dried skin, these are the dried skin, uh, sheep skins you saw earlier. Um, they're now tanned, they're now very stable. Um, we can keep them like this indefinitely without them rotting or, or, or going bad. Uh, and, they're, and they're actually now in the same state as those skins we buy pre tanned from India. So this is the same side as I showed you earlier. So again, you can see that if we buy the skins like this from India, we are saving a lot of time, uh, a, lot, a lot of time and money um, for the company. But we don't, we don't have control of what's happened pre up to this stage, stage of these skins. So we need to do a lot to these, these skins to actually make them into book by the way. And again, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, from the crust, we, 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 now sort, we can now sort for different orders. So Talus, for instance, gives us an order for 12 chieftain or 12 book calf. Roger will take all the book calf and he will decide uh, which ones will make grade one and which ones will make grade two, all the time looking at blemishes, looking at marks, looking at the back of the skins to see how well they were um, taken off the animal. Because if they're taken off badly, you get uh, cut marks at the, in the reverse side, which if you're not careful will show through on the finished leather. And will only th show through on the book when it's finished. It won't always show through on the skin. If you've ever look, looked at the skins we supply on the reverse side and you're on your handover, they should always be smooth. If you ever see a, if you ever see a, a dent or a, a groove, then that should, even if we've marked it as, up as a grade one, 
you should downgrade it to a grade two because you know that will cause a problem for the book line at a later stage. And we try and spot all those before we sell them. Um, this is probably one of the most important processes sort of. Um, if we do it well, we will select skins with slight marks to go into our cheaper levels, and the very cleaner skins will go into our top end levels. And obviously we're making more money on our top end levels, so the sorting um, takes a lot of time. And Roger may go, this is Roger, our managing director, he may go through each skin, look at each skin five or six times to decide where he finally wants it to go. Quite a time consuming process. We're now going to dyeing. Dyeing is the most expensive chemical we use, the dye stuff are the most expensive chemicals we use in the tannery. So prior to dyeing, we want to take the skins which we've got, which may be one and a half, two millimetres, we want to take them down more or less to the right substance that we're going to be selling them at. So for goat skins, that may be 0.9 of a millimetre. Uh, for calf, that's going to be 0.6 of a millimetre. What we don't want to be doing is using dye of stuff we're going to shave off later. So we want to make sure we've got more or less the right weight of material before we start to uh, dye. Uh, the dye process happens in the same drums as uh, the tanning. Um, and other things can happen here, in here too. With the Indian goat skins which we buy in dry, they can go in the same drums. We will strip out as much of that tannage as we can. It is a very poor quality tannage for bookbinding leather, so we can get rid of about 90 to 95% of that original tannage using you know, specialist chemicals. We can then re-tan using the same shoe McIntyre that we used earlier on in those sheep skins we saw. We can dye, off, we can dye, we can also add other tans. We can, for our archival leathers, we add aluminium. We add 2% dry weight aluminium sulfate to the leather, um, which makes, uh, we do that on our chieftain goat and on our archival book calf. And it makes the leathers last a lot longer on the book. So these are calf skin, they, they've been, They've been dyed and they now need to be dried. And our book calf are dried on sheets of glass, grain side to the glass. Um, and they go through a tunnel which uh, over a period of 24 hours are allowed to dry under, under slight heat but more or less naturally. And um, again, you'll be familiar with the book calf, are quite shiny on the surface, and that shine comes from the process of putting the skins off the glass, burnishing the skins. A little bit of paste is put on the corners of the skin. And again, on the book calf, you'll sometimes see some pale pieces on the corners. And that's from the residue paste. We can normally get three skins on each side of the glass, or so six skins per sheet of glass. Skins are, are dried, they're then pulled off, and each sheet of glass has to be dried, uh, uh, cleaned uh, by hand. Um, what you don't want is any residue, anything left on the glass, otherwise, it transfers to the next skin going on. Drying on glass is all very well if you've got a skin where you, you're not worried about the grain. So calf, is, all the calf have a very smooth grain. You're not worried about squeezing the grain out. You can't do that to goats. The goat have to be toggled. And they put on these frames with holes in with the special metal toggles. They're put under a light tension and they are allowed to shrink a little because as they shrink, the grain is pulled out.
So we've got, we've got skins which have been tanned, they've been dyed, um, there's no more wet work to be done to them. Um, some of them are ready more or less to be sold, but they, they need to be taken down to the right substance. Uh, so the calf at this stage may be about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, we need to get them down to 0 0.6. The goat skins may be 1, 1, 1 1.1, we need to get them down to 0 0.9 to 0 0.1. And that's all done on these dry, dry, shaving, dry shaving machines. After they're shaved, they need to be buffed off. It gives, it gives the reverse side of the skin a very even finish. Um, you don't want any lines or um, shaving machines can put little um, ridges in the skin. So we need to get rid of all those buffing. This is another buffing machine. We use this for our um, bagpipe leathers. Um, being a Scottish company, we have to make bagpipe leather. 90% uh, of all our production is for bookbinding leather, and 10% is for bagpipes, which we sell all over the world, including the States. And so there's a big bagpipe market over here. <laughs> um, skins are measured regularly, so they've been shaved and um, we, we measure across the spine, so we fold the skin in half, we measure across the spine and half, half the measurement, and that's the, that's the weight. And our skins, I think we're one of the few, but we de-dust our skins. Our skins aren't very dusty. I think some of our competitors' <coughs> leathers are a bit more, a bit dusty. So this is a giant vacuum cleaner. The skins go in and it just pull, pulls off all the loose uh, dust. Okay, at this stage, the skins are still quite stiff. They've had lots of wet processes, and as you know, when you wet something and dry it, whether it's clothing or many materials, they tend to go stiff. So we need to soften them. Various ways we can soften our leathers. Uh, this is a boarding machine. We have a wooden table that can move in and out between the rotating rollers, and, this, and the skin is pushed into the rollers and out the bottom. Uh, for the bookbinders amongst you, are you a bookbinder? No. You know. If you ever get hold of, if you're ever given a very stiff piece of leather or leather which is too stiff to handle, the easiest way to soften it is to run up over the sharp edge of the table, grain side, uh, flesh side down, and just do this to it. And that will soften it. And that's exactly what we're doing here mechanically. This is a relatively harsh process, so we can't do it with a more delicate leather. So, book calf has to be done by hand. Um, we uh, this is called slickering. Uh, it's a it's a metal blade, which is put into the skin. You, you hold the skin with your body there, and you move the blade across the skin, and it's gently releasing the fibres and softening them up. Again. Probably five, minute, five minutes per skin, just to give you an idea of what it takes to do that uh, uh, by hand. And then we have our chieftain goat, Alan Tord leathers. They're quite strong, um, quite hardy, and we, for those skins, we stake them. And what we have here are two rollers on top and three blades underneath, and the, the arm moves forward grabs the skin and the whole mechanism, the skin stays still, the whole mechani me mechanism pulls the skin between the uh, rollers and again it's a softening action. 
So there you can see the two rollers on top and the three blades underneath. And you, you breathe in when you're doing this one. So we can do various things at this stage. The calf skin, may, the book calf for instance, may be ready to sell. The Alan Tord, the Alan Tord leathers will be ready to sell. There's not much more to do to the Alan Tord other, to let them, other than to let them condition and that's absorb a bit, a bit of moisture. Many of our leathers need further finishing. The chieftain will need to be pigmented and polished. The book calf may need to be brought up to shade. We tend to dye slightly lighter than we want to finish with and then we'd bring them up to, up to uh, shade uh, by, by dyeing. And that's all done, pig, whether we're pigmenting or dyeing, surface dyeing, it's all done in this spraying machine. It's a long, it's a long tunnel with uh, cords on, and the skins lie on the cords. And we can surface dye or we can pigment on this machine. Some of our leathers we need to finish by hand. So our sprinkled calf, you've seen that, it's, it's a calf with little dots on, which is an antique type leather. Um, we do that by hand. So that's, that's a finished calf, sprinkled calf. That's how we do it by hand. He can get 10 skins to look exactly the same, which is quite clever. I've done it once and I had one big blotchy on the front. <laughs> so skins are just drying. Um, they take half an hour to dry once we've surfaced the uh, dye. Oh, that's an interesting picture. These are calf skins from India. And the big hole on the left is the hump on the Indian calf. Um, I think they're called Brahmin carp, I believe. Um, the ones with the real hunch. So uh, that's where that's where the hunch used to be. Um, and in fact, the skin of that shape won't go through a lot of our machinery very well because it will snag. So we tend to either cut them in half, which is the, which are the half skins uh, we, the, the kits we supply them with, or we cut them across the. The middle of the hole, and we supply you with a square butt. Have you ever bought butts from us? You only buy the half skin. If you ever get a customer who's <coughs> after a really large panel, you ask us for a butt rather than a, a kit, and you get a great big square piece. Um, so, this is a polishing machine, it's a, it's a piece of chieftain. It's a glass roller and it's purely heat, it's a burnishing action. Without that, the skins look very dull and dead, so you really do need to polish them just to bring out, drive them up. Some of our skins have to be printed, whether it's the commercial leathers or some of the smoother skyers. And this is one of our printing machines. We tend to, um, we tend to pr uh, print that smooth goat. And it knocks out any imperfections and, and puts a smooth grain into the, uh, into the leather. Begin to see all the processes and how much time is spent on any one skin. 
Um, it's one of the reasons <coughs> Aleb is quite expensive, and I'm the first to admit that Aleb is not cheap. Um, so many of the, our processes are pan processes rather than big factories and conveyor belts. It's all, every skin is handled uh, several times over. This is another, uh, this is another embossing machine. This one has all the decorative, uh, all the decorative embossings like the Morocco grain and the uh, straight grain. They've got samples over there. Um, this machine's 90 years old and it's still working. I mean, everything was so engineered, over-engineered 100 years ago. It's probably going to last, if we're still around, it's going to last another 100 years as well. What we have here on the top, underneath, underneath the word turner, we have rectangular plates, which are about a foot wide and four foot long, and they are facing down, they're heated up, and the skin is placed green upwards on the table and is pushed into the plate. We have about 20 different plates with different effects, so you, you, you can see some of them in these samples. Skins have to be measured. Uh, again, we're using a machine which is over 80 years old, um, which is quite interesting because the British standard for measuring leather is still done using this machine. There's no laser machine which can do it quite as accurately as this. And one of the reasons is it deals very well with the irregular shape of the skins. It won't measure holes. So you never buy holes from us. We give you those free of charge. Um, what it is, you have, you have a, a roller with pins all the way around the diameter and all along the length. And as it rotates and as the skin goes through, it depresses these pins. And each pin it depresses is a, is a, a square decimeter. So a square decimeter is uh, four inches by four inches is a square decimeter. So yeah, so we're we're accurate up into up to a ninth of a square foot roughly. <laughs> really it. I mean, their leather's now ready to be sold, to send, be sent out to customers like Taris. Uh, we sell a, a large range of uh, non-leather products as well. Here's a view of the, uh, the finished warehouse. Our website, uh, we produce uh, twice yearly a newsletter called Skin Deep, and we've been doing that for 20 years, I think. 18 years. Um, if you click on Skin Deep and then go to the index and then go on to leather, there are nine or ten articles on the manufacture of leather for any of those who are brave enough to read up any further on it. Um, if anything, it's a great cure for insomnia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any So, in your words, what what defines bookbinding leather versus other types of leather? Okay. Certainly the weight. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about clothing leather or, or upholstery leather, they tend to be heavier. Uh, they also be they also tend to be made from cowhide, often from cowhide. Um, quite interesting. Why don't we use cowhide for bookbinding leather? Bookbinders want their leather to be between 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of a millimetre up to a maximum of one millimetre. Needs or, you know, products that you're supplying change over that, the years. That's another lecture, but in, in brief, it's changed massively. I mean, I've been with the company almost 30 years now. It's scary. 
I've been with the company 30 years. Um, the number of large book binding companies in England alone, and I, and I won't mention what's going on over here or in the rest of the world, has dropped dramatically. So we have a lot fewer large customers. We have many more small customers. One man bands working from home, working from sheds at the bottom of their backyards. Um, so gone are the days where we have many customers buying lots of skins at once. We have many small customers buying fewer skins at and, and that's difficult because it's, um, for us as a company, our bread and butter are the big orders, the big edition jobs. Um, you, um, you saw on the sli earlier slideshow some of those books. If, if we get an order for a, an edition binding of 100 copies or 200 copies or 300 copies, for us those are the really meaty orders where the costs of our overheads are covered on those big orders. So if we can keep the factory going on big orders, all the smaller orders cover and pay for themselves. They become more profitable. Uh, in England, 30 years ago, we had, when I joined a company, there were, I think there were 14 or 15 schools teaching bookbinding, craft bookbinding, uh, to a degree level. There are, there's one school now in the UK teaching craft bookbinding. So it's people like Rob Shepherd who are doing, he's doing his short courses. Uh, there's lots of short, uh, one week, two week summer courses where you can go and learn, but there's no full time degree courses in it. So it, it, it is changing, we, and we've had to adapt. Uh, we, we are, we're working now with bookbinders who are concentrating more on additional kind of work, on those larger 50 copies, 100 copy books. Because we, we have to have those orders to, to keep going. So, uh, you guys order large quantities. Um, for, us, for us, that's very important. That your customers can come to you and buy that off the shelf. It's very important. You can supply it to us for um, probably at least 50 years. Yeah. After, where, after book buying the warehouse. Yeah, it must be 15 years. The days that we carried it out. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Took it on the plane. Yeah, yeah. Any other queries at all? Questions? I hope you get an idea of just what's involved. It's, it's quite a complicated process. Um, I don't make leather. I've never made leather. I, I just sell the stuff. So if I wasn't very eloquent at places, uh, you have to forgive me. Um, I've learned this stuff by osmosis, I think, rather than actually doing it myself. Although I did uh, that staking machine with the chief and goat where we were softening it, I did that for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and that was it. That looks pretty good. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's such, such a scary, such a scary <laughs> machine. You have to make sure your hands are in the right place. Well, that's not the only thing you have to make sure is in the right place. It's quite interesting. When we moved, uh, when we moved five years ago, uh, the health and safety came and checked the new factory. We set everything up. Um, the very early slide I showed you of the drums was actually before we put them in cages and then the latter slides mm -hmm. with the drums you saw behind cages. That first slide I took uh, the day we uh, set them all up and put them in place. They weren't actually even wired in. Um, the health and safety guy came to us and says, right, we need this guarded, we need that staking machine guarded, we need the boarding machine guarded, the glazing machine, the one with the glass polishing, we need that guarded. And we had to fight a case saying that if we guarded those machines, they would become dangerous to use. Because you would be too far away to be able to control what you're doing with the skins. In both cases, it's the, your body is leaning against the skin, dro drooping over stopping it being taken, taken away by the, by the mechanism. Um, and we won, so we don't have to, it's actually safer not guarding, guarding those two machines. But you have the ability to, no, you have the ability to really reason with somebody. Yeah, well, uh, they came and we, we explained what would happen if we guarded them, and the guy said, no, you can't guard. So, so well, that's what we told you uh, two weeks ago before you came in. 
problem is, is in, in England, there's 10 tanneries there. So there's no knowledge among, uh, we call it the health and safety executive, I don't know who's here. OSHA. Yeah, the health and safety executive have no knowledge of leather manufacturers, so you've got to teach it what's involved. Um, and, and it's the same in any of those industries which are dying. Uh, there's, there's, there's no knowledge among the health and safety people. And that brings us on to another point. You asked what the future is. There's now, we can't buy any of our chemicals in the UK. There's no, because there's no tanning industry left, apart from a few of us, there's no market for anyone to make any of the uh, chemicals. So we have to import it from Germany, from South, uh, South America, for the, uh, the, uh, tar, the tar and the shumac comes from, South, uh, from Chile and from Venezuela. You're from Chile? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so it's, it's tough. Okay. It's tough. We're holding our own and we, we keep going. But, um, company's 200 years old. I'm not sure if we're going to be around in another 200 years. I won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Any questions? Anything at all? <laughs> How his flight was. <laughs> <laughs> In closing, thank you, David, for coming. Um, yeah, this was really great performative, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so, and thank you, everyone else, for, for coming and attending. Um, you know, there will be more, and we'll keep you informed a little bit. Thank you again. Have a blessed Yeah.